Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the final CyberSight webinar for the year 2020. And boy, what a year it's been. I think we all are happy to see this one come up in the rear view mirror. And I hope that all of you are staying healthy and that your families are staying healthy. Uh, personally, I did come down with COVID a couple of months ago, and I can tell you it really sucked. Uh, I think I've had dengue fever before, and this was like dengue fever times five. So uh, as soon as you can get access to a vaccination, please do go ahead and get it. Um, some light at the end of the tunnel here. Uh, my colleagues here in the U.S. are just this past week getting their first doses of the COVID vaccine. So hopefully, at least in the U.S., within the next six months, we'll have a significant um, uh, vaccination program completed. And I hope that all of you um, equally have access to that in the very near future. And today's presentation is, it's superior oblique, but we are largely restricting it to superior oblique palsy. So if you had questions that were uh, Brown syndrome or otherwise, I will get to those in our next presentation. So evaluation and management of superior oblique palsy. Uh, this is really a favorite topic of mine and I find that it's of interest to people. This is not going to be just a lecture. Um, we have, um, some a few videos here, uh, we have your questions, and we'll have some case discussion. And then that's also something I'd like to do more of in the future. Uh, this brings us to our very first poll question. Well, what is the most common cause for vertical diplopia? Um, and it probably doesn't matter if it's adults or children. But you can see what our options are here. Uh, DVD, dissociated vertical deviation, double elevator palsy, skew deviation, superior oblique palsy, third nerve palsy, thyroid ophthalmopathy. So um, obviously the title of today's lecture is going to be a dead giveaway, right? And there we go. Um, Appreciate that uh, you are paying attention. Good job, and it's true. So, uh, you know, when we the reason these are important, is really, anytime someone walks into my office and they say they see two things up and down, or they see double vision, which is diagonal or oblique, like these two E's on the screen, then that that is. To me, that is a superior oblique palsy until proven otherwise. There's just, it's going to be that. Um, and now, of course, you need to exclude the other things that we'll talk about, but this is super common. So we need to be familiar with it. We need to be comfortable with it because frequently we're not comfortable with this. Once you get out of just a horizontal esotropia, exotropia, a lot of us are now out of our comfort zones. So the first audience question um, is related to differentiating this. Uh, how do you tell the difference between a skew deviation and a superior oblique palsy? And this is from uh, one of our participants in Egypt. Well, usually the difference is that superior oblique palsies are going to have incompetence. They're gonna be different in right gaze versus left gaze. Uh, now, it's true that sphere oblique palsies can become more comitant over time, but in general, there is some significant incompetence. Uh, interesting thing, skew deviations, well, we don't frequently think of them as having torsion. They do, in fact, frequently have torsion with them. And, and really, to tell these apart is a diagnosis of exclusion, and uh, it, it can be difficult. But Skew deviations, we're looking at a very particular population. We're looking at usually the elderly or those that are at risk for strokes or have had strokes, because usually this is, uh, or demyelination, I suppose. Uh, this is usually brainstem related and pre-nuclear vestibular input. So very difficult to image that, but, um, uh, but some of these characteristics of the, the accommodance or incompetence, I would say is the number one way to differentiate this. And like I said, a lot of times these are out of our comfort zone. We have someone come walk in like this gentleman on the right. He's got a big head tilt. He's got this oblique 
diplopia. And now we were like, oh my gosh, we have to measure every position of gaze to figure this out. Well, that's not quite true. And I, one of the things I wanna do today is show you just a very simple way to approach these patients. This shouldn't be complicated. Takes a little more time than uh, horizontal strabismus, but it shouldn't take a lot more time. I'm talking a five minute or evaluation or less. Uh, some more audience questions from the Philippines. What are the possible causes and diagnostic um, considerations? Uh, what causes superior bleak palsy from Nigeria? Well, the vast majority of what we call superior bleak palsies are congenital. Okay, they present either in childhood with a head tilt or they present in adulthood as something that has decompensated. These congenital palsies, and I'm saying palsy with quotations um, for a very good reason, these are usually due to the superior oblique tendon being too long, sometimes what we call too lax, too loose, too long. Well, you can just think of this as the opposite of a Brown syndrome. Brown syndrome, the tendon is too short, too tight. In a superior oblique, in a congenital superior oblique patient, uh, it's usually that the tendon is too long, too loose. It's not that the nerve is palsied. Um, and so I think that's a bit of a misnomer term that we should keep in mind. Uh, it's not like there is typically damage to the trochlear nerve. Um, this is usually a result of that complex structure of the superior oblique tendon. Uh, the other 25% one quarter are the acquired palsies. And I think easily in my practice, the uh, most common ones are trauma. And we frequently think about these as being bilateral, but they can be bilateral, asymmetric, or they can even be unilateral. And we're not talking about trauma like, oh, I, I fell down, uh, tripped on the carpet. We're talking about trauma where someone fell off a ladder, someone fell off a building, someone was in a car accident and they hit their head severely and that maybe they were in a coma for three days or they were in ICU for a week. These are significant traumas usually. These are not just bumping your head and then during your daily routine. Vascular, so of course aneurysms, uh, inflammatory conditions can cause damage to the trochlear nerve. Neoplastic tumors, of course, compress on the trochlear nerve. Uh, people can have surgical causes for trochlear nerve palsies. Um, any kind of intracranial surgery. So adults, adults, when we see an adult, one of the things we're trying to figure out is this decompensated congenital or is this acquired? Because what we do with that patient and the workup we do in terms of further investigations is going to be dependent on that. And I'll, I'll try to give you some tips that how do you sort that out? Because I don't, every adult that I see with a fourth year palsy, I don't just go image all of them. I image a very distinct minority and I'll show you how that works. Uh, first, we should kind of look at the spear oblique anatomy because like we said, it is unique. This morning, getting my coffee here. Uh, primary function of the inferior, of the superior oblique because it comes in and this big reflection through the trochlear complex and then inserts Inserting behind the equator, right? So inserting behind the equator back here. And so because it comes in obliquely, it's inducing in cyclotorsion. So in torsion is its primary function. So when it's damaged and not doing its job, the eye gets ex cyclotorsion. So that's a major hallmark and it's something that's under evaluated when people see patients. Uh, because it's behind the equator, it's a depressor as a secondary function. It's pulling the back end of the eye up, pushing the cornea down. And then finally, uh, because of the fact that it's, uh, um, it's positioned here, it can, and then posteriorly, especially these posterior fibers, they are, when they contract, they're going to produce some um, abduction of the eye. So those are the tertiary functions. Uh, another set of audience questions. First one from Bangladesh. Easy way to measure superior oblique palsy. Second question from Tanzania. 
systematic examination for palsy in brief. This sums up what I want to pass on to you. Let's make this easy. Let's make it brief. Let's not make this be a big headache. You can make this really complicated if you want. It doesn't need to be. Uh, here is my basic needs when I see a superior oblique palsy patient. We always do primary position measurements right here. Uh, I'd like to see up gaze and down gaze to see if we have A patterns, V patterns or limitations to um, motility. And then I like to see right gaze and left gaze. And this is what I'm looking for in those gaze positions. Am I seeing inferior oblique overaction? You don't always see superior oblique underaction. As a matter of fact, I would go out here and say, you usually don't see superior oblique underaction. But you do see this, the inferior oblique overacting is, is what is easily seen and is our hallmark. So those five positions of gaze will serve me in and, 90% and of the cases. And then add to that the head tilt test, Bill Shousky head tilt test. Tilt to the right, tilt to the left. And we'll discuss why that happens if there's a difference in head tilt. It's another important simplified topic. All right, so that's the data I need. Before I show you that typical superior oblique palsy, let's talk about how we document this. Because as I see um, strabismus consults coming into CyberSite, I frequently see that people um, are not comfortable with how to document motility or strabismus measurements. Uh, when I measure someone's motility, first thing I do when I sit down to examine a patient is I have my little toy, my Tigger toy, right here with me. All right, so I have a fixation toy, and I move this left, right, up, down. Maybe I'll go up to the oblique positions to kind of bring out um, their inferior oblique overaction, but I want to see their motility and their versions to make sure um, I'm seeing overactions, underactions, or any kind of restriction. And then I need to document that. These are two systems on this slide, but they are really the same. So one is this kind of star asterisk system, uh, which is diagrammed for a right eye here. The left side is the one that we use at my institution. It's more of an H, but despite the shape of the bars, what's the same is the location of the muscles because each of these bars is a position of the primary function of that particular muscle. So medial rectus, adductor, so it's in on both sides. Opposite is the lateral rectus, out on both sides. Superior rectus takes the eye up and out on both sides. Inferior rectus takes the eye down and out on both sides. Superior oblique down and in, inferior oblique up and in. And that's again, superior oblique palsy, that's the one we're looking at. So uh, real quick uh, whiteboard exercise here. All right, so when I see a patient and they have inferior oblique overaction, I think probably most people use this system. If I see that right, RIO overacting, and this is subjective, all right? It's plus one, it's plus two, it's plus three, it's plus four. Um, so then, you know, I'll put a plus two like that. Uh, if for some reason you were seeing, because that's the IO position, this would be the SO. If for some reason you did see inferior oblique or superior oblique, excuse me, superior oblique underaction, you could go minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. Just like this could be plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, all right? That's the very same thing as doing the H's like we do at my institution, right in for oblique overaction plus one to plus four. I will grade it and I'll put a number there. If I'm showing underaction of the superior oblique, I'll go minus one or minus two, Usually for what we see with superior oblique palsies, 
you're either going to see normal or you're going to see minus one. And yes, this is subjective. There's no great way to um, quantify muscle underaction and overaction. But as long as you're consistent in how you do it, then you know what it means to you. One is a little, two is a medium, three is a medium, four is a lot. It's just that simple, okay? All right, so back to my um, lecture material here. Whiteboard demonstration. So uh, again, in CyberSight, these grids are built in. Here you can see the, the lines in the background, the asterisk star. And if you click on the arrows, you can then enter plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, or minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. So I encourage you to use that because when we look at photographs for giving you consultations, this supplements that. The photograph is a moment in time. This is your impression. So use both, please. And then documenting uh, on your EMR or your paper, whether it's blank paper or a pre-printed printed paper like this, I still use paper forms. Um, and this is what our strabismus pediatric ophthalmology adult strabismus form looks like. Let me highlight a couple areas. Again, mo their versions, our motility, the H system, the strabismus grid, the tic-tac-toe grid here, primary position, up gaze, down gaze, right gaze, left gaze, up right, up left, down right, down left. Oops, let me go back. I almost never use these four corners. I have to really see something abnormal on the motility for me to start doing these oblique measurements. So usually we're playing in this zone right here in the middle. One last circled area, DMR, that stands for double Maddox rod, measuring torsion. This is something that I see is done very infrequently around the world. And we are gonna talk about this and I'm gonna highlight why it's critical that you have this uh, ability and do this when you evaluate, especially superior oblique patients. All right, same thing carries over to your CyberSight form when you're submitting a strabismus consult. If you click, the H is for horizontal, the V is for vertical. If you click on those, it opens up numbers. So you can put in numbers for the strabismus. These are your prism measurements. It also includes the head tilts for the Wilshowski head tilt test. All right, so I'm, I'm talking about this and taking just a couple of minutes to go over this with you because most people don't use this and I want people to be comfortable with this because it helps whoever's giving your opinion, your professional consult to you, it helps them to give you accurate information. And so you don't have to fill out the full form, but you need at least of the few of the key areas with prism measurements, okay? All right, audience question. This one from Saudi Arabia. Is inferior oblique overaction, which we frequently abbreviate as IOOA, accompanied with superior oblique underaction? And I've talked about this just a little bit. The answer is maybe, okay? Uh, I would say most of the time I can't see superior oblique underaction because most of the patients we see are congenital palsies uh, and they, their superior oblique works. It just doesn't work super well. So when they force it, they can take it through its full excursion, full version. So most of the time, no, you don't see definite superior oblique underaction. However, when you see acquired palsies, especially severe acquired palsies, you definitely can see superior oblique underaction, okay? Minus one, minus two. I would say that those are common numbers for acquired, acquired palsies. All right, back to simple. How do we make this simple? Well, I talked about looking at versions having the patient track you around, right? Looking specifically to see that there's no restriction and looking specifically for inferior oblique overaction and superior oblique underaction. So again, it comes back to the Tigger toy or some other fixation device that the patient will track. 
measurements, three-step test. We're gonna talk about that and we're gonna make it simple. You really need to have prism in your, in your, um, in your clinic to do measurements for spear oblique palsy. However, interesting patient like this in the clinic, this is a little baby, this child, a lot of times I don't need PRISM to make the diagnosis of spear oblique palsy. I don't need to do measurements in every gaze position. I can just look at this child's versions if we had a video and I could tell you they have a spear oblique palsy. And if that kid has a head tilt, I'm gonna go ahead and operate regardless of what the measurements are. And so we'll chat why, why that is. Um, why would you be so preemptive on surgery like that without measurements? Torsion. Again, big one that people don't do. You gotta measure torsion or have some assessment of torsion. There are other ways to assess this. So we'll talk about that. And then the fat scan. This is how you avoid the CAT scan. And I will tell you what that is coming up. So first of all, let's talk about equipment and prisms. This is our second poll question. Uh, I've seen many places that do not have prisms. So question number one, answer number one, do you have prisms in your clinic? I don't care if it's a loose set of prisms or vertical and horizontal prism bars. I use both. I think that's ideal, but do you have that? Or if you don't have prisms, do you at least, uh, number two is do you have prisms? And number three is, do you have prisms and double Maddox rods for torsion? And number four is, do you have really fancy stuff? You've got prisms, you've got double Maddox rods, and you have Hess screens. So go ahead and answer that. And I'm asking about Hess screens because well, I had several questions about Hess screens and Superior Blake Palsy. Um, we do, I do not have Hess screens. I don't use Hess screens. And so I'm curious to see how many of you actually have those. Okay, so uh, this is a, well, I only surprise here. Okay, so some of you don't have prisms, not surprised, I see that all the time. Um, many of you in the middle zone here have prisms and double Maddox rods. I'm glad to see that that's true for double Maddox rods. Uh, and then I see a uh, larger percentage than I would have guessed have Hess screens. All right, I'm not going to, I'm going to touch on that, but I'm really not going to talk too much about Hess screens because I don't use them. And I, I, I think it's, it's against what my concept or my, um, my mode here is of keeping things simple. Um, and this, here are these audience questions I alluded to. Any simple way to remember superior oblique palsy in a Hess chart, this is from India. And then from Nigeria, evaluating unilateral spear oblique palsy with the HES chart. All right. So HES charts, this is what they look like. Um, this one is, a, I stole this from this person on the internet that you see at the bottom. Uh, HES chart of a congenital right fourth nerve palsy. So this is right eye here. This is a congenital right fourth nerve palsy uh, or superior oblique weakness. And that's what it looks like. Um, to me, this is not simple. It's a nice diagram. It's like having someone that can do a nice Goldman visual field for you. But if I were to do this in the office, either I would have to do it and it's going to take a lot of time or I have to have a very trained person who is capable of doing this and it's going to take them a lot of time or the patient's going to have to come back on another visit to get it done at another time. So while maybe this can be helpful in a, a smaller percentage of patients, I think that probably 99% of the time, you don't need this. This is making things too complicated. This is like using synoptophores for routine strabismus. So if you are interested in this, uh, great, knock yourself out. But since most of, most of us don't have this available, I'm going to skip it and I'm gonna to stick to keeping it simple. All right, step one, when I see a patient that has vertical oblique diplopia, I wanna look at their motility. I wanna look at their versions. 
And what am I looking for? Right, she's got the head tilt. I measure a vertical in the primary position. And I'm like, all right, I'm gonna look for an inferior oblique overaction. It's there until I prove it's not, all right? So this is not a great gaze picture on off to right gaze here, but, uh, but there is no inferior oblique overaction. So she's got a right tilt, make a note of that. She got right inferior oblique overaction. Boom, right now I've just narrowed down my diagnostic considerations to superior oblique palsy and just a few other little things, okay? Observation. Now, I want to supplement that with measurements. You got to get out the prisms. You got to get out the vertical prism bar. Um, probably there's frequently a horizontal component to this. It's usually not significant. So if you want to keep it simple, just measure the vertical. And then maybe in the primary position, measure the vertical and the horizontal together. But in each of these positions, I want to get the, um, the vertical measurement and then the head tilts. All right. Um, I just got a message that my headphones are going to die in a little bit. So at some point, I'm going to switch audio. So just be prepared. It's going to be amazing. So up gaze, down gaze, side gaze, head tilts. We need this. This is the minimum you need to do your diagnosis and evaluation. Uh, and torsion, right? So down here at the bottom, I've got uh, measure torsion, double Maddox rod. This, this is the holy grail right here of evaluating superior weight palsy. All right. Um, make sure I didn't skip. Okay, we're good. All right, next question from Lebanon. Any pearls to differentiate between inferior oblique overaction and dissociated vertical deviation? Yes, this can look the same, right? So you take someone has DVD, you take them into side gaze like over here and the eye goes up. It's going up because uh, vision's being blocked by the nose. So it's like having an occluder over this eye. How do you tell whether that's DVD or true hypertropia? You do alternate cover testing in side gaze. When you alternate cover test this person in side gaze, if this is a DVD, you will only see this. You will only see the adducting eye go up. You will never see the corresponding hypotropia over here. All right, if this is hyper, this should become hypo when you do alternate cover testing. That's how you differentiate. All right. Next audience question from Canada. Please describe in simple terms the Bielshowski head tilt test. Right, so you gotta understand this to understand the three-step test. How does this work? Well, the Bielshowski head tilt test is that uh, when you tilt the head, to the side of the superior oblique palsy, the eye goes up. So this lady has a right superior oblique palsy. She's in a right head tilt position. Her right eye elevates. She develops a worsening of her right hypertropia, which is why she adopts a left head tilt generally when you just leave her alone because she's fusing now. There is no hypertropia. It's all under control. Well, why does this happen over here? This happens because the superior oblique, when she tilts her head, the eye, this eye has to in cyclotort. This eye over here has to ex cyclotort. So because the superior oblique is weak and this eye is not effectively in cyclotorting, the backup muscle, the superior rectus, Superior rectus, while it's primarily an elevator, it's one of its secondary actions is to provide in cyclotorsion. And that's because it's positioned like this on the globe, right? It, it's not straight front to back, it's at an angle. So the superior rectus is an in cyclotorter. The superior oblique is not doing its job. The superior rectus tries to help out, but Superior rectus is a much better elevator 
than it is an encyclotorter. So yes, it produces a little bit of encyclotorgen, but it also is producing a lot of elevation. And that's where this head tilt positivity comes in from with the Dushowski head tilt test. All right, three-step test. This is confusing. It's great if you understand it. It's fine if you can just do it. I'll be happy if you can just do it. So how do we just do it? Well, when I see uh, a patient that I think has a cyclovertical muscle problem, I, I said I use a piece of paper, an exam note. I just flip it over and I write on the backside. And this is what I write down, S-R-I-R. I, O, S, O, and I do that for both eyes. And then as I look at my strabismus measurements, I start circling groups of these. All right, so flip your paper over or get a scrap piece of paper, write down these four muscles. Why these four? Because these are all vertical and they also have some torsional impact. I mentioned the superior rectus is a, uh, in cyclotorter as a secondary function, as is the inferior rectus, because it's also at an angle, it's an ex cyclotorter as a secondary function, okay? So those, when we have oblique strabismus, these are the four muscles of interest. And our lady in this example, measure her in a primary position. She has 15 prism diopters of right hypertropia, all right? A right hyper is the same as a left hypo. One's up, one's down. How it looks just depends on which eye they fixate with. If they fixate with the right eye, they've got a left hypo. If they fixate with the left eye, well, now they've got a right hyper, okay? Same thing. So if she has a right hyper, that could be a weakness of the depressors on that eye the bottom set here, so I circle those. If she has a right hyper, that's the same as a left hypo, so it could be a weakness of the elevators in this side, so we're circling the elevators on the left side. So step one, we have right versus left, elevators versus depressors. Step two. Is the strabismus, the hypertropia, is it worse in right gaze or left gaze? Well, we've already seen she is way worse in left gaze because she gets this big left inferior oblique, or I'm sorry, right inferior oblique overaction. So our lady, let me back up one slide. Our lady, she clearly is worse to the left side. Right, right inferior oblique overaction, her deviation strabismus is worse to the left. So now we're circling cyclovertical muscle pairs that work in left gaze. So in left gaze, it's either the right inferior oblique and right superior oblique right here, or it's the two here the superior, left superior rectus and left inferior rectus. So I'm gonna circle both of those muscle sets, all right? These are the elevators working in left gaze for each eye. So now two steps down, that's right, one to go. Third step comes back to that Bielschowski head tilt test. Is she worse, is the patient worse with right head tilt versus left head tilt? this lady is worse with right head tilt, okay? And I put this little green line there because we're gonna be looking at diagonal circles now. We're gonna this way or this way. So you can just think about this circle I've drawn here imitating her head posture, all right? This is the way to kind of remember this last one. Sure, her head is tilted to the right when her strabismus is worse. So I'm making two circles tilted to the right here and there. Just duplicate her bad strabismus head posture. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. 
yes, you, if you understand the Bill Showski head tilt test, you can come up with this on your own. But if you don't remember that, just duplicate her head posture and that'll get you through drawing the circles. Because once you've drawn the three circles, you're looking for this, where do they intersect? Or where do they not intersect? When they intersect, it maps out to her right superior oblique, which is exactly what we expected uh, to see. Now, if you get something other than that, don't be surprised. You just need to maybe recheck your measurements or consider other diagnoses. It's nice when it maps out perfectly, but it's not always going to map out perfectly, especially if someone has spread of comitants or other reasons. So my piece of paper that I've been circling, this is what it looks like when I'm done. And I'm, again, I'm happy to see that it's consistent with what I thought the diagnosis was. Now, the, that's what makes the three-step test so great. It can really reinforce your diagnosis and give you confidence when you're planning your surgical uh, interventions and making your diagnosis. Audience question from India. Well, how ap accurate is the three-step test in long-standing cases? Well, it's a good question because long-standing superior oblique cases, you can see a spread of comitants where the measurements become more equal in the different positions. They're not always totally equal, like a skew deviation, deviation would be, but you see that the numbers are less and less and it's six hyper here and eight hyper there. They're not that different. And then you start to say, well, did I measure it right? So you can see a spread of competence. This is one of the, what they call perversions of uh, the three-step test. And by perversions just mean, what are some of the anomalies when it's not accurate? Well, if you have vertical rectus contracture, let's say like this lady, she, this lady maybe has had a long standing, severe right superior oblique palsy. So her eyes been hypertrophic all the time. Well, if that right superior rectus becomes contracted, all of a sudden her strabismus is going to be a different pattern than if that right superior rectus wasn't contracted. So any kind of vertical rectus contracture, whether it's from thyroid or injury or inflammatory can throw the three-step test off. And again, that comes to number two here, restrictive disease. Restriction doesn't, doesn't play well with the three-step test. Uh, if you have paresis of more than one muscle, third nerve palsy, three-step test, again, is not going to be very accurate. Skew deviations, another one. Previous surgery. So previous surgery can throw off the measurements and the accuracy of the three-step test. Things have been changed. Myasthenia gravis, because it acts in funny patterns and can be variable, will throw off the three-step test and then dissociated vertical deviation. So when we talk about differential with cyclovertical muscle strabismus and oblique diplopia, these are the things that are on the differential that if our evaluation doesn't clearly map out to an isolated superior oblique palsy, these are the other things we now need to consider and evaluate the patient for, okay? So three-step test is an awesome tool, but it's not always perfect. Next audience question. How to differentiate inferior oblique overaction from mild superior oblique paresis? This is from Pakistan. And again, another good question, just like the one about skew deviation and differentiating that. They can look very similar. Um, and I would say in general, if I was to differentiate between inferior oblique overaction and superior oblique paresis, I'm probably looking for torsion as my primary uh, thing. Um, torsion, incompetence, but probably largely torsion. And then of course, um, well, I won't talk about traction testing at this point, it may not apply, but I think torsion is gonna be the main thing. But bottom line is that these can look the same, um, but 
your treatment's probably going to be the same, even though they're different conditions, perhaps. Torsion, this is the big one. I want the world, all of you, to have more love for double Maddox rod testing of measurement. We, this is such a critical element for severe oblique palsy, which is a common condition. What do you need? Well, you need double Maddox rods. What do we mean by that? Well, these are Maddox rods, the right, you need a, it's better if you have a red one and a white one, because then you get this image like here, where the patient can see a red one and a white one, and it's a little bit easier to tell which is which. Um, but you can do it with two of the same color. The trial frame is nice because then you can quantify how much torsion. What we do is we put pencil marks on the frame of the lens. And then when they rotate them to line them up, so we put the glasses on, this is what the patient sees, they see not two parallel lines, but they see one's at an angle and one's not. And then we have them reach up and adjust. Doesn't matter which one they adjust, as long as they make them parallel, adjust one of the um, uh, side, the knobs on the trial frame until they line them up. You can say parallel, but I usually say like railroad tracks. A lot of people don't know what parallel means, but everyone knows what railroad tracks are supposed to look like. So we have them line them up like railroad tracks. And then using that mark, you can read how much X cyclotorsion they have. So double Maddox rods are going up and down. The image they make, the image the patient sees is going side to side, okay, like that. And then this patient has five degrees of X cyclotorsion, in this case on the right eye. Um, you just have to be careful. The lenses, the glass part can rotate inside the frame and you just need to make sure that the Maddox rod stays lined up with your pencil mark. But this is what we do to really quantify torsion. If you don't have that, but you just want some other objective measure, especially in young kids, babies with head tilts, you can uh, pick this up on their fundus exam or adults, you can take fundus photographs and you can get some assessment of torsion that way. This is a normal fundus photograph. This is the fovea. This is a line going to the optic nerve. The normal fovea sits right at the middle of the optic nerve or maybe just below the center of the optic nerve, okay? Now this is in a photograph, keep in mind in a, an indirect ophthalm ophthalmoscopy, it's gonna be rotated, it's gonna be opposite. Uh, here's a fundus exam. So let me go back, normal, let's go forward. On indirect ophthalmoscopy, this is reversed. So here's not the exact center of the optic nerve, but maybe kind of a one third demarcation. And the fovea should be right around that area lined up with that. Now, if there's torsion from a superior oblique palsy, and again, this is the inverted view from an indirect ophthalmoscope. This is a right eye, normal right eye. Fovea is going to line up or be a little above that mid Leiden point. But if there's significant torsion, now the fovea is up significantly. The fovea is above the upper edge of the optic nerve. So this is what we're looking for. This is usually um, obvious enough. And here's a fundus photograph showing that this is these are bilateral fundus photographs with um, bilateral superior oblique palsy. You can see here's the line coming from the top of the optic nerve to where the fovea is. That line from the fovea is actually above the top of the optic nerve. Fovea above the top of the optic nerve. So this is, this is a kind of significant torsion you can pick up on examination to confirm your double Maddox rod testing or in place of if you don't have that available to you. Torsion pearls, these are, these are important. Congenital palsies may really not have much torsion. And again, that's because the superior oblique um, is functional. It's not truly palsied. It's just got a 
long tendon. So it can crank it out, it just can't maintain it. Uh, so they may have little or no torsion, um, but I would say that they usually have some. Most, most older kids or adults that I see with congenital palsies, they'll have two, three degrees of excyclotorsion. Acquired palsies essentially always have torsion, okay? And it'll be more, it'll be like four to five degrees of torsion. Bilateral palsies, this is the big one, okay? Because you can have an asymmetric bilateral palsy and it looks like a unilateral palsy until you operate on it and then you unmask the other side. If you measure torsion and they have more than 10 degrees of torsion, you need to be thinking, is this a bilateral palsy? Because they will, they'll have 10 degrees, 15 degrees. Down gaze, they might have 25 degrees of torsion. So this is where it's very important to have this torsion measurement. It helps sort out congenital, acquired, bilateral. Next audience question from India. Investigations for determining the etiology of superior oblique palsy. From the UK, we have how to distinguish between congenital and acquired and when to scan for acquired. So I think this is the big question. When you see someone, A, you need to sort out, is this congenital or acquired? If you're confident that it's congenital, I never image those, okay? That's, that's, uh, that's just a tendon problem. If you are confident that it's acquired, you need to be able to explain why it's acquired. If you know they had brain surgery or they had a massive trauma and were in a coma for a week, okay. I'm okay with that. They've, they've probably already had imaging anyway. But if you see someone with an acquired palsy and you can't explain why, well, now maybe you do want to get an MRI on that person or whatever other investigations that might be appropriate. Okay, so acquired palsies, if it's clearly acquired, I would image those. It's not always clearly acquired though. And a lot of these can be decompensated congenital palsies. And there are other ways to sort that out. All right. So what are some other tips to sort this out? Degree of torsion we mentioned with the double Maddox rod. If it's acquired, they're more likely to have significant measurable torsion. Vertical fusion and amplitudes, vertical fusional amplitudes. If you have a congenital palsy, they are used to fusing up and down for a long, long time. And if you, once you get the prism that they can fuse with, you can keep adding more and more vertical prism and they'll keep fusing it together and it builds up. All right, most, most of us that don't have superior oblique palsies we become diplopic if you put more than one or two prison diopters in front of our vertical, in front of our eye. But people with congenital palsies can build up and they'll tolerate three, four, six, ten. They can fuse a lot of prism. Uh, people with acquired palsies are more like us. They can't tolerate prism beyond what it takes them to fuse. They become diplopic. Okay, so. Acquired palsies usually have small fusion, vertical fusional amplitudes. Congenital palsies usually have larger fusional amplitudes. Fat scan, I mentioned this before. Fat scan, not CAT scan. Fat scan stands for family photo album tomography. Look at old pictures. If you look at someone's picture, they're 40 years old and you look at their picture from school and they've got a head tilt, well, that's probably a congenital palsy that decompensated, right? So, but if, if, if you've got a 40 year old patient and they've got a head tilt and you look at their old pictures or their ID card, their driver's license and their head is perfectly straight, whoops, that probably is acquired. That's, they don't have an old evidence of a head tilt, right? So facial asymmetry, 
and head tilts is what we're looking for here. Facial asymmetry is another one. So facial asymmetry is not specific for superior oblique palsy. It just simply reflects that someone has had a chronic head tilt. And what you get is kind of a compression of the downhill side of the face and you get uh, expansion of the uphill side of the face, if you will. And so you can see this torticollis of any sort. And here's a diagram of that, right? So we've got a line going through the, the lips and we've got a line going through the head. And because they've got this chronic tilt, this, uh, this side of the face is compressed. This side is widened. You'll see asymmetry of their nasolabial folds. All right, so facial asymmetry is a sign of a long-standing chronic head tilt. And this is soft tissue changes and bony changes. It's not, it's not just soft tissue changes. All right, and here's that fat flashing back to the fat scan. If I showed up in your office, yes, tomorrow, and I have a big head tilt, you say, pull out your ID card, Dr. Neely. It's from 2018 and my head is straight. So now we're like, yeah, this is probably acquired. He doesn't have a head tilt in his uh, driver's license. Okay, so, but if you see that someone's got this long standing head tilt in their old photographs, well, now they probably don't need imaging. They don't need a CAT scan. They don't need an MRI. We can see that this is probably congenital. So more audience questions from Nepal, when to not treat a superior oblique palsy? Well, that's a good question. Just because someone has inferior oblique overaction or DVD or whatever they have, doesn't mean we have to operate on everyone. So yeah, if uh, someone doesn't have symptoms or someone doesn't have a big head tilt causing problems, they don't need surgery, they just need monitoring. Uh, from India, mild superior oblique palsy, does it need to be treated even without diplopia? And again, same as uh, first answer, no. Like anything, it depends on, are they symptomatic? Is it hurting them in some other way? Are they getting facial asymmetry? Uh, are they having double vision, All right? So mild palsies can be observed, they can be treated with prism, they don't necessarily need surgery. What are the indications for surgery in children? This question from Sri Lanka. Yeah, different ballpark here because these are the kids that we see come in and they're one or two years old and they're like this, their head is turned slanted over and they've got what looks like a spear Blake palsy. To me, that's an indication for surgery because this child, if this child is like big head tilt like this all the time, now they're gonna get the facial asymmetry and that's going to be permanent. So if I can identify that in an infant, I'll go ahead and do an inferior oblique myectomy. I may not be super aggressive with things, but I'll at least get that and try and get them back straightened up. Uh, from the United Kingdom, how soon should we operate after diagnosis? Well, in an infant, as soon as I'm confident that I have enough information from versions, maybe prism diopter measurements, maybe fun distortion on ophthalmoscopy, boom, I will go ahead and operate. Adults, how soon you operate just depends again rather than on uh, how symptomatic they are, right? Uh, again, and here's that kid, kid with a big head tilt. I don't want this kid to get facial asymmetry. So as soon as I pin down this diagnosis, I'll go ahead. I don't, I'm not gonna wait till they're school age. I'm not gonna wait till I can get accurate gaze position measurements in every direction and they can do double Maddox rod testing. If I see this and they have big time inferior oblique overaction, maybe some torsion, good to go, inferior oblique myectomy. All right, another set of questions. These were similar from Argentina and India. How do we help the patient with associated diplopia or, or if it's affecting their occupation or schoolwork? Well, Depends, right? Always depends how significant is their problem. Um, if it's mild, no symptoms, no significant head tilt, we observe. If it's mild, they have mild diplopia or it's intermittent, we can try prism correction. 
grind prism into the glasses or we can do a stick on Fresnel prism. Not a big prism person, but they do have a role. However, if someone has a larger deviation, they're bothered by it all day long, they're having trouble with their job or their school, or it doesn't look good, or they don't wear glasses and they don't want to wear glasses, they don't want prism. Okay, now we talk about surgery. So it's a, like a lot of the things we do with strabismus. Uh, question, uh, similar question from Peru and Colombia. What is the limit for treatment with prisms. And then uh, from India, in superior oblique palsy with diplopia while reading in particular, how much prism can we give and how? All right, so what I do um, is I will, I will do my measurements and I do alternate cover, right? So that's the maximum prism measurement, alternate cover. But the patient may need only part of that to fuse. So I will give them a vertical, prism bar and let them slide it up and down in front of their eye until trying to find the minimum, the minimum amount of prism that brings the image together and that they think the image looks clear and is comfortable. And if I'm going to do prism, that's the amount that I give them. Um, for ground in prism in the glass, the limit is practically, it's like six, eight, maybe 10, but as you get up in eight and 10, there's a lot of thickness and distortion and uh, optical center issues. So most people don't really tolerate when you get 10 or above. For now, stick on prisms. You can give someone a 20 prism diopter, a 40 prism diopter for now, but there's so much distortion that it's practically just occlusion. Um, so from a practical limit, it's smaller amounts of vertical prism. Uh, for the second question here with reading, how much do we give? Well, you have to see how much prism they need in the reading position, looking down, and then you have to see if they still tolerate that in the primary position looking straight ahead. If they do, then you can just give prism in the whole thing. But if they don't, then you have to have either two pair of glasses, or what's called an executive bifocal where you have two pieces of glass. This has one amount of prism, this has another amount and it's fused together. Um, I have a very difficult time finding um, optical shops that can make that kind of different um, prescriptions, different prism in the top and half and bottom. So that's a possibility, but it's, it's difficult, it's expensive too. Next audience question is what about and we're almost getting to a couple videos here. So hang in there. I know we're rolling up on one hour here. Uh, can it be treated with Botox? This is from Columbia. Well, not a spear oblique palsy is not an ideal candidate for Botox because you would have to put it in the antagonist muscle, the inferior oblique to weaken it. And I would say there's a pretty good chance you're going to contaminate the lateral rectus or the inferior rectus and now you're gonna get other vertical deviations. And plus it's temporary, you're gonna to have to repeat it. So um, personally, I don't see a big role for Botox here and I would be such an easy surgery. I can do an inferior oblique myectomy in about less than 10 minutes for sure. So it probably takes you three minutes to do Botox. So I don't see a big difference here. Uh, okay, now we're getting to the surgical question. So how, how do we fix this? If we're, gonna, if we're gonna do surgery, what do we do, right? So we need to talk about surgery and we need to talk about bilateral palsies still. Um, from Egypt, efficient surgical management of superior oblique palsy. Okay, that's, and that's what we want. We want efficient, simple, systematic. Ecuador question, which surgical technique do you prefer to treat superior oblique palsy? Right off the bat, I'll tell you 90% of the time I'm doing an inferior oblique myectomy, okay? Or a recession maybe, but 90% of the time we're talking about inferior oblique myectomy because you just got to get these people back in the ballpark. If you just get them close, they're happy. They're, they're, they're good. Um, from India, management approach for unilateral superior oblique palsy. So let's, let's look at unilaterals here first. All right, so when I'm planning my surgery, 
number one, I want to know, well, what's the primary position? Because if the primary position is less than 15 prism diopters, I'm probably, I'm just doing one muscle. That's all I'm going to need. Okay. One muscle, less than 15 prism diopters. And then I'm looking at the versions. I'm looking at the inferior oblique overaction. Okay. If someone has 10 to 15 prism diopters of deviation in the primary position and they've got visible inferior oblique overaction, I'm going to weaken that inferior oblique. I'm going to do a myectomy or I'm going to do a recession. That's it. That's going to get me there. Um, torsion. Looking at torsion because I want to make sure I don't have a asymmetric bilateral superior oblique palsy. Because you'll see the surgical approach to a superior oblique palsy is much, much different. And you can have small deviations in the primary position. And yet you've got a bilateral superior oblique palsy that needs surgery on both eyes. So torsion comes into the equation, even though steps uh, numbers one and two are the most important. That's also important. Uh, superior rectus contracture. If I see evidence that the eye does not depress because the superior rectus is contracted, I need to recess that. Okay. And then traction testing. At the time of surgery, I do traction testing so that I know what the superior oblique tendon feels like. These are all part of my plan. Superior rectus contracture. I mentioned that. Why does that happen? So in this patient, in this photograph, this patient has a long-standing left superior oblique palsy, okay? So the left eye has been hypertropic. It's been elevated, manifest for a long time. So the superior rectus here has contracted. And now when they look down and to that same side, it's restricted. It's not going down all the way. So what happens is the contralateral Okay, the contralateral superior oblique now overacts. Okay, this is Herring's law um, of motor correspondence, right? So um, the eye's trying to go down and out over here, but this is restricted. So it's getting extra, extra input to the inferior rectus. And then it gets an equal amount of extra input to the inferior rectus's yoke muscle, the superior oblique on the other eye. And so you get over depression. So we're looking for this when we talk about um, superior rectus contracture. And also this is when you might be doing those oblique position measurements because this is gonna be their area of greatest deviation down here. So that's about the only time I start going off into the corners of the strabismus grid. Traction testing, we want to be able to tell if that tendon feels too long, lax, loose, all right? And this just gets graded again subjectively, one to four. Little bit of laxity, medium laxity. Is the tendon even there? I don't know, I don't feel it. So how do we do this? Well, this is a surgeon's view from the top of the bed, left eye, left screen, right eye, right screen. And I kind of grab almost like a V pattern, right? Grabbing obliquely. And then I'm going to push the eye up and in and rotate it. You also are retro pulsing the eye. You are pushing it into the orbit. And that's different than when you're testing rectus muscles. Rectus muscles, you test restrictions by pulling the eye out and then moving it around. Here, we're pushing into the orbit and we're rotating side to side across that tendon, the superior oblique tendon is right here, right here. We're gonna roll back and forth, back and forth across that tendon. And it, if it's there and it's normal, you feel like bumping over a log. It's like rolling a ball over a log, you feel it. If, you, if it just rolls like it's a flat, flat floor, you're not feeling the tendon and it's probably uh, too long, it's lax, it's loose, all right? So here, just you can just see when we've just pushed the eye up and in. This is kind of a normal view on the left. You can see a little bit of cornea still. L look how the right cornea just disappears. 
totally buried here. All right, and then when you do surgery and you look at the tendon, here's the left superior oblique tendon, normal laxity. But look at this one on the right where the cornea just disappeared. You see how much extra tendon there is. It's very lax and that confirms your diagnosis. All right, so here's video. We're gonna look at this and pushing the eye up and in. This is a Brown syndrome, right? So it's really tight. All right, so that's not a normal tendon, that's a Brown syndrome. Let's look at that one more time. Brown syndrome tendon, tight. Oh, oh, that's super tight. That's a plus three, plus four. All right, now I'm showing you that because now we're going to, now we're gonna do a tenotomy on that Brown syndrome so that we can create a superior oblique palsy. So here's the superior oblique tendon and we're cutting it. All right, we now have a total superior oblique palsy from the tendon. So let's look at what the traction test is like now. It should be very lax and loose, right? Grab the eye, push it up and in, and it just disappears, right? There's no cornea at all there, it just disappears. So that's what a lax tendon looks like. Now you can't just do this one time. You need to do this when it's a normal eye. You wanna feel normals so that you know what abnormal feels like. So don't just do it on your superior oblique patients, do it on some others. All right, laxity pearls, superior oblique laxity pearls. So it's variable, but in general, superior oblique laxity is exclusive to congenital palsies where the tendon is too long, right? Again, opposite of Brown syndrome. There are cases of acquired palsies that have tendon laxity, but most of them don't. But keep that in mind, you can find it if someone really has like a, a totally dead superior oblique and it's been there for a while, you'll find some tendon laxity on traction test. Inferior oblique overaction is usually significant when the tendon is lax, okay? Um, and that guides us to maybe then we want to tuck it. So be looking for inferior oblique overaction. Always compare the relative laxity between the two eyes because a lot of times if it's, we're looking for asymmetry, okay? That's what create, asymmetry is what leads to these vertical deviations. So we're looking for asymmetry and that's what we want to fix. Um, and again, practice on normal eyes so that you uh, know what normal is before you have to decide what's abnormal. All right, okay, now what do we do? What are we gonna operate on? Well, I mentioned inferior oblique already. But the basic premise to, to strabismus, to strabismus surgery in general you're always trying to match the deviations to the muscles. So you're picking muscles that have their effect in the direction of the greatest deviation. And that's kind of the concept of the NAP classifications, right? So there's NAP, NAP one through seven. And the grids in the NAP classifications show where the diplopia is greatest. And then that leads to suggesting which muscle is that you weaken or operate on is going to give you the greatest effect in that position. And, and so you don't have to go by the NAP classifications, but that's the concept of what you're going to do when you operate. And you may, so you're finding your area of greatest deviation and then you're gonna modify that based on the magnitude. Do you need one or two muscles? Based on the superior oblique tendon laxity, maybe you wanna tuck if it's lax and based on superior rectus contracture on exam or on traction, because if it's tight, you probably want to recess it just like any restriction. So we have these modifications. All right, again, deviations less than 15 prism diopters. Single muscle surgery usually, okay? If there is inferior oblique overaction, weaken it. I don't care if you do a recession or a myectomy, but weaken it. That'll That'll fix that patient 90 plus percent of the time and it's easy and safe. 
My personal technique for this is if it's very mild inferior oblique overaction, plus one, I'll do a recession. If it's plus two or more, I'll do a myectomy, okay? Uh, when I say recession, I'm talking about a 10 millimeter recession, which is measuring uh, three millimeters down from the inferior rectus insertion and two millimeters over. Uh, myectomy is probably equivalent to a 14 millimeter recession, which is placing the inferior oblique over the vortex vein. So that's a different lecture. Um, if there's no inferior oblique overaction or excyclotorsion, they just have the vertical deviation, then maybe I'll go to just a vertical acting muscle like the contralateral inferior rectus because that'll help with my incompetence and gaze to the opposite side. Or if the superior rectus on the same side is restricted, then recessing the ipsilateral superior rectus for the hypertrophia, okay? So um, those, are, those are definitely less common for me. I easily 90 plus percent of the time, this is what I'm doing up here, okay? These others are more supplemental in my, in my practice. Audience question from Pakistan. I have a question about inferior oblique muscle surgery, tips on how to grab the inferior oblique during surgical manipulation. This brings us to a video because this, this is where it's at. Inferior oblique surgery is simple, it's easy, it's fast, but yet it's really difficult. What's difficult? Difficult is getting it in position so you can do it. Once you get the eye in position, it's easy, but there are tips. And so let's look at a video and let's talk about these tips. So uh, this patient's had something done to the medial rectus, probably a medial rectus recessions, probably, a, I think this is a congenital ET patient. So fornix incision, uh, going through the, in, in the infrotemporal quadrant, conjunctival incision, tent up to tenons, open tenons, and spread it down in that quadrant. Now we're hooking the lateral rectus here. This is the lateral rectus, and I'm putting a 4-0 silk suture under the lateral rectus, and I'm going to use this to position the eye. Now I'm pulling it in, and I'm going to pause right there for a second, because this position is critical. The 4-0 silk is going across the bridge of the nose and then is taped, it's clamped over to the drapes on the far side of the head. This white, this is a gauze. I'm placing that under the suture so the suture doesn't bite into the patient's face. When you bring this eye in towards the nose, you want the cornea to be up, up and in, like the position of the inferior oblique overaction. The cornea needs to be above the suture when you clamp this uh, with the hemostat, okay? This is what you want to see to put the inferior oblique in the easiest position to grab down here. What I'm going to do now is open up this space, all right? And so this is a Stevens hook and it's just kind of opening the space up. What's going to grab the superior or the inferior oblique is this long hook. This is a von Grafe hook. A von Grafe hook has no knob. It, uh, let me back up a little bit, maybe. Yeah, so this is the von Grafe hook right here. It has no knob. It's like a giant Stevens hook. And this is going to go in, hugging the sclera, staying as close to the eye as possible and it's going to blindly come up underneath the inferior oblique to get it up so I can see the posterior border. So let's watch that. It goes in, I can't see the inferior oblique, but now, ah, now I just went back to the beginning. Okay. All right, so here we are. All right. Scroll back just a tiny bit more. All right, so the Von Grafe hook has gone in and it's elevating everything down here. It's lifting up the inferior oblique. It's lifting up the fat. It's lifting up the periorbita. It's getting it all away from the sclera because I want to see three structures. I want to see a triangle 
that is um, a triangle that is inferior oblique. And I'm going to a new share here. I'm going to be looking for a triangle down here. This is what we're looking at. Um, our incision is opened up here. Okay. That's the lateral rectus. The lateral rectus has a suture going under it. Okay. That von Graefe hook is in there. And that little Stevens hook is right there. What am I looking for? Well, I am looking for this has picked up the inferior oblique. The inferior oblique is right there coming up to the lateral rectus. I'm also looking for a vortex vein. Now it will stretch, but I don't wanna break it or cut it. Vortex vein, and then the final thing we're looking for is, um, this is gonna be a little bit odd, but the border of the sclera. So we have this triangle which gets formed. Vortex vein, posterior border, the inferior oblique, sclera. All right, and this is going to be white. And this is how I'm going to isolate the inferior oblique. All right, so this is going to be an inferior oblique, but let's watch this in action now. All right, so this is the posterior border of the inferior oblique. A little bit tough to see, but we're going in at the Stevens hook. I'm gonna go just past that border and we're gonna hook it. Just past the border, hook it. Vortex vein, damn it. Killing me smalls. Hook the inferior oblique. You can see the little triangle back there real quick. So now we have the inferior oblique plus other stuff and we try and unload everything till we're, that tip of the hook is right up against the muscle and then we pierce underneath it. So we don't want all the fat, we just want the muscle. And now we're placing larger hooks to open up that space underneath the muscle. And this last green hook here gets reversed to elevate everything away so we can see the insertion down here. And then we're just cleaning off the insertion. And now we're putting a hemostat across the insertion of the inferior oblique. And we're going to disinsert it from the sclera. And again, keep in mind, this is right along the inferior border of the lateral rectus. So now, now once you have the inferior oblique disinserted, you can do anything you want to it, okay? Put a suture in it like this so that you can do an anterior transposition or a recession, or you can put another hemostat across it right here and remove this whole section. This is what I usually do. I'll cross clamp right here with another hemostat and I'll take off the distal 10 millimeters of infrablique and then I'll just let it go. I don't suture it back on, right? And uh, so that's what I'll do. Um, either a recession, like with the sutures being put in, or a myectomy, okay? And I'm going to stop that. All right, so that's that's how I find the inferior oblique. Now there are other ways to do it. You can put in hooks underneath the muscles, you can elevate with a retractor, um, but this is a real nice way to do it. Um, all right, if the angle is question that comes from Spain, uh, I'm gonna try and wrap this up. We got it closing in on 90 minutes here soon. If the angle is greater than 15 prism diopters, do I need to touch operate on two muscles? Answer is yes, generally yes. So how do you pick the second muscle? Well, I will almost always weaken the inferior oblique as my primary muscle, and then I'll add a second muscle depending on what else I see. So uh, if the superior oblique does not feel super lax, it just feels kind of okay, or just a little bit lax, 
I will recess the contralateral inferior rectus. Again, that's for the incompetence off to the opposite side. And again, I will recess it. I'll, I'll assume that the inferior oblique is going to give me close to 15 prism diopters. And then I'll base how much more I need at a dosage of three prism diopters per millimeter of inferior rectus recession. Okay. If, if the ipsilateral same side superior rectus is contracted, I will recess that instead. That's uncommon. If the superior oblique tendon is super lax, redundant, I will tuck that. So I will usually pick one of those three things. Um, and let's talk about tucking. It's our final poll question. When performing a tuck, how much do you tuck? How much do you, do we always do A, four to six millimeters, just do kind of a small, medium conservative? Or number two, do you tuck enough so that it feels tighter than the normal contralateral side? Or three, do you tuck enough so that both eyes feel similar on traction testing? And again, you know, you get into this, it's, it's all about similarities. Uh, uh, you, you, we have a problem that's because the two eyes are dissimilar. We need to equalize that. So how do we do that if we're going to do a tuck? What's our endpoint? okay? And yeah, so about half of you said, yeah, tuck them so they are similar. And that's right. Now, sometimes that tuck may be four to six millimeters. Um, you don't want to tuck extra. You will create a Brown syndrome. This is where superior oblique tucks sometimes get a bad, bad rap when people avoid them. Because if you tuck it too tight, you're going to get a Brown syndrome. And it's really tough to fix that once you get it. So on the table, once you have sutures in, your endpoint is tucking it so that the traction test feels equal. All right. Um, always err on the side of under correction because these, these patients have large vertical fusional amplitudes frequently and they can keep doing it. But if you make them go the opposite way, they have never done that. They don't do it well and they are miserable. Shoot for under correcting them in general. Also in general, I say in general, maybe not always, but in general, probably shouldn't tuck a tendon that's not lax on traction testing. Now, there are times when it's helpful or necessary, um, but it's, it's a smaller percentage for sure. So be careful about tucking non-lax tendons. How do you do a tuck? Well, you can use a tendon tucker like this, just designed to lift the tendon and keep it smashed together. That's helpful, but you don't have to do that. You can just have a muscle hook under there. And then you're putting in a suture at the borders, um, front and back to make this fold. And you can use a non-absorbable suture like Mersaline braided polyester, or you can just use Vicryl. Some people then tack that fold down. I don't do that. I just leave it up and tuck it all back in. But that's basically how you do a tuck. And what you do is you put those sutures in then do your traction testing, see how it feels. If it doesn't feel symmetric, cut those out, do more, do less, whatever you have to do until the traction test feels equal. Now, let's talk about bilateral palsies as we close out on things here. Scary patients. What do we see here? This guy's coming in with a chin down. All right, this is a hallmark of a bilateral spree oblique palsy. Why do they do that? That's what we're gonna talk about. So audience questions from India, diagnosing and managing bilateral palsy. Yes, we'll talk on that. What subjective complaints does the patient with torsional diplopia have and how do we measure that? Well, we talked about double Maddox rod testing and we talked about the fact that um, they usually have more than 10 degrees of excyclotorsion. So um, our doctor from Turkey, let's talk about torsional diplopia. Okay, so they generally have large degrees of excyclotorsion, more than 10 degrees, measure it with double Maddox rod, and they have complaints that things are tilted. The classic thing to ask them about is door frames. Door frames should look straight up and down, but they'll tell you that the door frame looks tilted. That's torsional diplopia, okay? That's the subjective complaint. 
chin down head posture. Why do they have that? Because they usually have a V pattern esotropia. So they have diplopia on down gaze and they eyes diverge and the diplopia goes away on up gaze. So to take advantage of that, they drop their chin. Now they're an up gaze and their eyes are no longer V pattern esotropia, they're ortho. But it does mean that they have diplopia in the reading position. That's a common complaint. Now, because both superior obliques are usually relatively equally affected, the primary position deviation, while they may have esotropia, they don't have much vertical. It's either the same or there's a little bit of difference. Okay, that's a, another thing. Uh, they do have alternating hypertropias. So right hypertropia, left hypertropia, look this way, right hypertropia, look that way, left hypertropia they get these alternating hypertropias, which is why we need the side gaze measurements and we need the head tilt measurements. We're looking for this condition. Uh, management of, this is from India. How do you manage bilateral superior oblique palsies differently than unilateral? Other question from India. Best way to manage the esotropia and down gaze with extorsion, right? So that's a problem. How do we do these things? that are unique to bilateral. Well, your approach to this is different than bilateral superior oblique palsies. And they all have the same goal though here, all the muscle options. You need to collapse that V pattern and reduce the chin down posture and diplopia in the reading position. You need to nullify any primary position vertical deviation and you need to reduce the torsion, okay? Simply doing bilateral inferior oblique myectomies um, usually doesn't work very well. It can help some, but it doesn't really drive home these problems. So usually this algorithm over here is what, um, what I'm choosing from inferior rectus recessions for the alternating hypertropia and the V pattern esotropia, uh, MR downshift for down, down gaze diplopia, V pattern, Harada Ito for torsion, inferior rectus nasal transposition for torsion, or superior oblique tucking for hypertropia and torsion. So you can see it's a little more complicated when you get into these. And again, bilateral IO weakening is usually not quite going to cut it. Um, so we kind of look at the yoke muscles to the inferior uh, oblique, uh, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the superior oblique. And so we're looking at bilateral recessions of the inferior rectus muscles, five to six millimeters as a really good approach. Collapses that V pattern. You can do it asymmetrically to compensate for any primary position deviation. So again, three prism diopters per millimeter difference on your recession if you need to neutralize that primary position. Audience question, when do you use Harada Ito procedures? This is from India. So Harada Ito is for torsion. Um, we typically perform superior oblique Harada Ito when you have bilateral um, superior oblique palsies with larger symptomatic degrees of torsion, 10 to 15 degrees or more. Uh, they, how does this work? So Harada Ito, you're working with the anterior fibers of the superior oblique. The anterior fibers of the insertion of the spear oblique are primarily torsional. They don't have a lot of vertical impact. So if you advance, if you split that tendon insertion in it and advance the anterior half or third of the spear oblique insertion, you can produce torsional changes without inducing vertical changes to any significant degree. Now the original Harada Ito looked like this, split the tendon, drag a loop of it, towards the lateral rectus, okay? Now over time, people have switched more commonly to this Fells modification, at least people that I know, split the tendon, put a suture in that anterior third to one half, and then advance that along its arc towards the lateral rectus. And measuring back eight millimeters from the insertion and just a millimeter or two above the lateral rectus, you suture those torsional fibers right there you now are inducing more in cyclotorsion, okay? Put it here, 
more encyclotorsion gets induced without inducing up and down. Uh, I'm going to skip through this. How much does that give you? Let's get to that. Let's, how much effect does that give you? In this study that, that um, I was a participant in, we compared bilateral and unilateral Harada Ito procedures. And on average, unilateral Harada Ito gave you eight degrees of encyclotorsion correction and a bilateral gave you 12. So it wasn't really proportionate double. So a lot of times you're gonna have a little bit of torsion left over, um, but that's what gets you in this ballpark. Um, one of the final audience questions, when there is a hypertropia more than torsion in a traumatic palsy, is it better to do a tuck than a Harada Ito? And I would say, yes, if you do a tuck, you're gonna get more hyper correction as well as a torsion correction. The Harada Ito is primarily a torsional procedure. So there should be in this particular question, some advantage to a tuck. Um, I don't have a video of a tuck um, that I'm going to show you right now for time reasons, but this is my plug for CyberSight. If you go to the library and look under videos and strabismus, you will find a very nice video of a superior oblique tendon tuck, fully narrated, and this was done on the Flying Eye Hospital. And you will find other strabismus surgical videos and um, on CyberSight. And again, these are all great because they're narrated, they're done by skilled professionals that are best in the business. So take a look at the video offerings in the CyberSight library. Um, there were many questions uh, about inferior oblique overaction and superior oblique uh, Brown syndrome, basically A patterns. Um, I did not include those because you can see this was a long presentation as it was. Um, I did not take many questions from the chat because uh, we had all the um, people that had submitted questions in advance that kind of um, uh, filled out the lecture. Uh, I'll take a look at the questions that are in the chat and um, if I can provide some answers to those on, uh, I will. The next time, let's talk about tight superior oblique tendons. Let's talk about Brown syndrome and A patterns. And a lot of those questions we can funnel in there as well. So uh, thank you for your, uh, for your attendance. Uh, I hope this was useful. Uh, goodbye 2020, bring it on 2021. Let's get the vaccine out there. Let's all, let's all stay healthy and do well. Uh, take care and I'll end this now. Thank you.